part of the planning committee for the symposium. I'd just like to thank everybody again for joining us today. I really enjoyed the speakers and the conversations that we've been having. Um, our final two talks this afternoon will begin with Marquette Zamova. Marquette joins us today as a PhD candidate from Dr. Scott Mills Lab at the University of Montana. Before joining Mills Lab, Marquette received a Bachelor's of Science degree from Charles University in Prague in 2009. She then moved to the University of Montana uh, around the world for her master's thesis, where she helped uh, lay the groundwork for research relating coat color variation to climate change in the snowshoe hair. Marquette was then an extremely productive master's student, and this follows through with her PhD work. Today, she will tell us about her exciting PhD studies involving the roles of phenotypic plasticity and evolutionary shifts and adaptation to camouflage mis mismatch in species coping with the impact of climate change. So please uh, join me in welcoming Marquette. around and thank you for the committee for picking me um, and flying me here and I really appreciate it and I am very grateful for, for being able to share my research with you today. Uh, so it's going to be a little different from what we've been hearing uh, all day but uh, in some ways it's similar and in some ways it's um, more applied science and uh, so you didn't hear any of that. So. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so climate change in temperate regions resulted primarily in warmer and shorter winters. And that has led to a number of phenological mismatches. And I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Uh, but just to mention some, uh, now migratory birds, uh, like these spite, <clears throat> these spite flycatchers, are coming to Europe after main caterpillar peak has passed uh, and having nestlings too late. Uh, Greenland caribou are coming to their breeding grounds after the main green up. Uh, or mammals that hibernate like ground squirrels and marmots are emerging from hibernation after uh, the optimal condition has passed. And in some cases, on populations. And so a lot of scientists, including me, are interested in this overarching question whether species will be able to adapt to climate change and climate change related stressors. And so the stressor I'm interested in is one of the major uh, signals of climate change across temperate regions, and that is reductions of days with snow cover on the ground. And uh, after yesterday's discussion around dinner, uh, this is good news for, for many uh, speakers today actually, but this is bad news for a lot of species. Uh, snow cover is declining uh, across the northern hemisphere with brown. So this shows changes in snow cover since the 1960s with more brown colors showing snow declines. And so across the northern hemisphere in the spring months, snow has declined by up to four days per decade. So this has negative consequences for many species, including color molting species, which I study. Those include 21 species of birds and mammals uh, that undergo this complete phenotypic change twice a year every year. So they're completely brown in the summer and they're, they turn to completely white in winter. Uh, they include prey and predatory species. There are three species of weasels, five species of mountain hair, uh, of hares. Arctic foxes are the only canids. Then an eight species of hamsters and uh, lemmings. And then the only genus of birds is ptarmigan, so there are three species of ptarmigan that, that color walls for, uh, for camouflage. And so we don't fully understand the physiological pathway that regulates the mold phenology, but we do know that as many other seasonal traits, color molds are regulated largely by day length. And day length drives the relative concentration of melatonin and prolactin. There are other things that play a role, but this is the most um, basic rudimentary pathway that drives it. So day length enters the brain through the eye and gets transferred to the pineal gland that produces melatonin exclusively at night. So as days begin to shorten during the fall, 
pineal gland produces more melatonin, which inhibits the production of prolactin. And so that combination results in growth of white fur. And then the opposite occurs in the spring when low melatonin, high prolactin will make you brown to mold to brown fur. So that fact that day length drives the initiation of these molds and that snow is declining results in this camouflage mismatch in fall and spring across a um, number of species. So I'm using these species and the specific stressor to better understand whether species will be able to adapt to climate change. And so during my graduate work, I'm asking two main questions. So I'm parsing this into two main questions, and that is, what are the consequences of a stressor? So in my case, camouflage mismatch. And can species respond adaptively, both through phenotypic plasticity or through, and or through evolution? And so majority of my work uses snowshoe hares. Snowshoe hares are widely distributed across the boreal forests of North America, where they are the main prey species. Uh, they're really common, they're really important, and they're really mismatched. So back in 2009, we studied nearly 200 hares uh, over two sites, and then we used radio telemetry to monitor them weekly for three years. We, so every time, so every week we would record survival, and then we would record their coat color and color mismatch. So we measure in, in suit of species, we measure coat color in percent white. Uh, so this is a typical mold phenology over the course of a year. You'll be seeing a lot of these, so I want you to get um, comfortable with them. But it just shows coat color in percent white over the over course of a year. So hairs or any other animal starts 0% white, so completely brown in the summer. Then they undergo this fall mold that there is an example of, uh, of a hair turning to white. Then they're white throughout the winter, and then they turn back to brown, and they're brown in the summer. So we are really interested in these periods when they are turning, and then we use different statistical methods to either describe the entire curve of the mold or to look at these stars and ends. And so we, so we measured coat color every week, and then we measured color contrast. And then color contrast is the difference between coat color and, and background. So, uh, so it's the percent white minus percent snow. So this guy is 100% white, there's 0% snow, so we would say he's 100% contrasted. So using this data, we were able to answer this first question, does it actually matter to be mismatched? Uh, and we did find really strong negative consequence of mismatch on weekly survival. That's what this graph shows. So there's individual color contrast on the x-axis. And you can see as hairs become more and more mismatched, so being completely white to so white on white versus white hair on brown background and vice versa, your survival decreases these, such as completely mismatched hair has about 7% lower probability to survive a week than matched hair. So that is a really strong negative impact. Um, that is likely to get worse over time because we know that climate change will result in less snow and more mismatch. So to see what kind of mismatch we can expect in the future, we downscale snow cover at our site in Montana. And that's what we show here. So this shows number of snow days for present. So we, we now have about 170 snow days in Montana. And then we predicted future snow for mid-century and late century under two different well, climate change scenarios for medium and high CO2 emissions. And so by mid-century, we are expecting about a month fewer days of snow on the ground. By the end of the century, nearly two months worth of day snow on the ground. So this should result in a lot more mismatch, and this might have really strong negative population consequences. So when we uh, combined, or when we used that cost of mismatch, and we projected that in population matrix model for the number of weeks when we are expecting hairs to be mismatched in the future, that resulted in 24% decrease in population growth rate. So in other words, by the end of the century, in the absence of adaptation, we are expecting hair populations to be decreasing by 13% per year. 
So that doesn't sound great. But we had this other question. Uh, what, if, what if they can adapt and actually avoid these, these, um, these declines? So we looked at plasticity first. Uh, they can adapt either through behavior or through mold phenology. So maybe they can modify when exactly they turn brown or white or how quickly they become the other color based on immediate winter conditions. So to start with behaviors, uh, so every time we would locate a snowshoe hair, we would record a color, but we would also record three different behaviors. Um, and so these are based on the fact that hairs can actually look at themselves and realize they are mismatched and then modify they, their behavior to reduce mismatch. And so we looked at if they are hiding more. So most of the time, snowshoe hairs are so they're so used to being camouflaged that they don't really hide. They don't go underground like rabbits. They don't hide in vegetation. Uh, they just sit on bare ground. But, but maybe when they know, they go underground or they hide more. So we, so we measured that. Uh, we measured uh, flight initiation distance. So every time we would approach a hair, we would measure at what point they actually run away from us. Testing, if they are more mismatched, do they run at a farther distance? And then lastly, uh, do they actually select areas on the landscape that would match their coat color and that would reduce mismatch? The only other time this was looked at was in ptarmigan. It turns out ptarmigan are, are smart birds. Um, rock ptarmigan in northern latitudes, the males stay white a lot longer than females, so after the snow melt. Uh, but after they were observed to mate, the males would go and they would roll in dirt to increase cryptid. So birds know, uh, hares do not know, or at least hares in Montana do not know what color they are. So this was a complete fluke. This was the only hair actually we thought to go underground. You can see the antenna sticking out. Uh, but they don't, they don't hide more, they don't fly away more. Uh, and they actually really like to sit on um, bare ground. So when snow starts to melt, they really prefer these tree wells or any kind of um, brown spots that they, in fact, increase their camouflage. So, so not great for, for phenotypic plastids. Probably not going to be way to go. What about plasticity and mold phenology? So then we constructed these curves uh, over those years. So this is, actually, this is over a year. And then each of these lines now show population mean mold phenology in the fall and in the spring, with each color showing that average for a year of observation. So, and then these dates show those start, average start and end dates, with these horizontal lines showing credible interval, intervals. So, in the fall, you can start at hairs. Each year start about the same time, early October. And then they finish, so they become brown uh, around mid to late November. So there is no plasticity in the fall mold. In the spring, though, they do start at the same time. So again, suggesting that day length really is the main initiator of these molds. But now there is some variation in how quickly they become brown. And this variation corresponds to immediate climate. Uh, so here I'm showing snow. So it's percent snow around those hairs. And so you can see that, that this 2011 dark line was a really long snow year. And so they were able to follow that and turn brown about one week to two weeks later than the other years. Uh, in the fall, again, snow is all over the place, but you can see that hairs are really on the same schedule every year. So to recap what we know so far, we know that mismatch is really bad for you. You, you die if you are mismatched. You're more likely to die. Uh, and then phenotypic plasticity doesn't seem to be a short or long-term solution to mismatch in the future. But what about evolutionary shifts? So are there, uh, can we detect any shifts in mold phenology in response to camouflage mismatch? So snowshoe, so given that snowshoe hairs have such a wide <coughs> distribution, I did not do that. I don't think I did that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so they are distributed ac across really large uh, latitudinal and environmental gradients. So, so given we know that, we expect there is variation in mold phenology. Uh, and if, this, if there is local adaptation in this variation, 
uh, to maximize mismatch, we would expect this variation to correlate with uh, things like temperature and duration of snow cover as opposed to latitude, which is a proxy for day length. And so we, test, we are testing that using three very uh, distinct sites, one in Canadian Rockies, one in New England, and then uh, very southern edge of the distribution in San Juan Mountains in Colorado. And so for that one, we are using pictures from camera traps that were given to us from these really nice people that are running these carnivore studies, by, but they end up with all what they call bycatch uh, pictures, but they are, uh, they are hair pictures that, that I use and I can uh, construct mold phenologies at hundreds and hundreds of sites across these three sites uh, for multiple years. And so, testing for local adaptation. The null hypothesis would be that uh, given day length drives mold phenology, we would expect the northernmost site, which is Canada, which is the red line, in the fall, hairs should turn first, so they should become white first, followed by the mid latitude, followed by the southernmost Colorado site. In the spring, the opposite should be true. So they should turn to brown first in the southernmost site, and they should stay white the longest and become brown the latest in the spring in the northernmost site in Canada. But in fact, that's not what we see. Uh, we see very different pattern. So now these are the real data, and then uh, the dots are actual observations from the camera traps. Uh, but you can see that hairs in Canada do start first, but they actually start at the same time as hairs in Colorado, followed by about a month later by hairs in uh, New Hampshire and Vermont. And then in the spring, it's also different. Uh, so New Hampshire and Colorado, um, Vermont starts first, that's the New England site, followed by Canada, followed by the southernmost site. So, so Colorado goes about a month, month and a half later, which is actually the southernmost site. So the opposite of what we would predict based on day length. And this variation corresponds well with, as you probably are expecting now, uh, climate at the site. Uh, and that is temperature and snow cover, duration of snow cover. So here I'm showing the fall malt again, and uh, one of the best predictors is minimum temperature during fall months. So these box plot shows for each of those sites, now each dot here is a camera trap, uh, average temperature during fall for the past 30 years. And so you can see that Canada and Colorado are the two very cold sites where hairs turn to white first. And then New Hampshire is about five degrees warmer on average during the fall. And then in the, now looking at the snow, which is also a decent predictor, uh, again, so now I'm showing the first day when snow comes on the ground and then sticks through the winter. And so uh, it comes first in Canada and then it, it leaves or it first got, uh, last in um, New England, which is about a month later. So that corresponds pretty well to that. Uh, month shift in phenology too. Then we see similar pattern in the spring. That one is a little more murky and I'm still uh, trying to finalize that, but uh, what else comes out is that uh, the spring temperature in New England is a lot warmer and hair start first. Uh, and again, uh, so now this is the snow, when snow uh, melts in the spring, and that again happens first in, in New Hampshire. Forget about you. Um, so, uh, so to recap again, we are finding some uh, evolutionary potential, but we are not only looking for evolution in space, but we are also <coughs> looking for it in time. So the other way uh, we are testing evolutionary potential <coughs> is uh, by looking for a historical shift in response to climate change that has already occurred. Uh, and we are doing that in Mountain Harris in Scotland, uh, which is a completely different system. Um, they are, so Mountain Harris are the Eurasian equivalent of snowshoe hares. They are important prey species, but they are about twice as big, almost twice as big as snowshoe hares. And at least in Scotland where we study them, uh, as opposed to boreal forests, they live on these um, 
heather moorlands, these really open uh, hills. And so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of different things about them, but we would still expect climate change to occur in these moorlands and hairs to shift their morphology. Because, oh yeah, so if you cannot see in the back, these are actually mountain hairs after the snow melt, so they're really obvious. Uh, but so has climate shifted since, uh, since those historical studies were done. Uh, so we see strong signatures of climate change since the 60s, uh, both in uh, duration of snow cover and in temperature. And there is a lot of variation at those uh, different sites where we work, but overall there are significant trends. So this one shows uh, number of snow in the <laughs> number of snow days in the spring, and so since 1916, the snow season in the spring has shortened by about 12 days, and then in the, the spring temperatures have increased by about 1.25 degrees since the 1960s. So we are expecting hairs to shift, such as that we would think that the fall molt starts later, so they stay brown later, and then they would start turning to the white, uh, to the brown <laughs> earlier in the spring. So we went back to Scotland and we resampled these studies at three of the sites over two years. So we used the same methodology. We walked across these highlands and counted how many hairs of different color we see. Uh, and so did we find those shifts that we predicted? And we are, there's very little evidence that hairs have shifted at all since over 60 generations. So now these curves show average phenology for the path, which is in the red, and for what we see now in the blue. And so there's little evidence that hairs are now starting to turn to white later than in the past, or turn back to brown earlier in the spring. So that might be surprising to some of you, knowing how mis or how obvious these things are. But after spending some time in Scotland, I realized that this system is very different from what we have in the Boreal Forest. Because those, most of Scottish Highlands are really highly managed for red deer and red grouse. There is very strong predator control. So perhaps there is not even any pressure on them to be camouflaged at all. Um, so to conclude, what, we, what did we learn studying color molting species and camouflage mismatch? Um, about species' ability to adapt to climate change. We learned that direct stressors such as camouflage mismatch can have really negative consequences for individual and population fitness. And then in the absence of adaptation, these species could decline towards extinction uh, pretty soon. Uh, we found that phenotypic plasticity is not optimal solution or is unlikely to save color molting species from climate change. Now, they're still mismatched or in the future. There's some plasticity in the spring molt, but it's obviously not enough to prevent mismatch or decline. There is some evidence uh, for evolutionary potential, uh, at least in areas where there is strong selection. Uh, but obviously, this finding is not transferable across systems or across species, because in another system, we found that animals fail to shift their malt phenologies in response to climate change. But overall, we do believe that evolutionary rescue will have to occur to uh, help these species persist in the future. And we recommend maintaining large populations that are connected uh, so evolution can proceed or adaptive alleles can come in. Uh, and we recommend minimizing climate change and, of course, other stressors. Uh, and then in the last few slides, I'm just going to show uh, some of our ongoing work because our lab continues to work uh, with camouflage mismatch uh, and we are focusing more on these evolutionary shifts. Uh, but now we are looking at evolutionary shifts in, in morphs. So uh, all, of, all of these species actually have uh, monomorphic and polymorphic populations. So they all have individuals, they just stay brown year round. We do think that these polymorphic populations where on one place during the winter you have white and brown morphs that coexist, 
can be really important for future evolutionary rescue for these species. Uh, but not a lot of it is known, uh, especially where they are. So we as a lab project describe distribution of these marks for eight mammal species uh, using museum specimens uh, from uh, 26 museums. And so this is my advisor, Scott Mills, with one of our postdocs pulling uh, weasels out of drawers in the Smithsonian. Uh, so we use museum specimen and we use uh, published records and verified observations of, of these winter phenotypes. And we create these, these maps uh, using those um, using those specimen, but also using three main predictors that really predict where um, color morphs are. And that is duration of snow cover, seasonality, and snow ephemerality. And so this map, this map is for snowshoe hares, uh, with blue colors showing probability of being white. So these blue are monomorphic populations where everybody just turns white for winter. And then more red colors show low probability of being white. So those are the populations that are, all hairs are brown. And then everything in between, all the greens and yellows, are these polymorphic populations where there is this really high genetic variation that, that can, um, uh, where selection can occur and evolution can occur. Uh, and we work with some, so, so given, um, yeah, I'm not gonna go there. Uh, and so these are the maps for other six species. So there are the three other hares, mountain hare, Japanese hare, and white-tailed jackrabbit, and three weasels. Uh, so for Michigan, and you can see if our maps are correct. So you should have polymorphic populations of long-tailed weasel uh, and of least weasel. And then uh, you should have white stoat, white short-tailed weasel. And then for hares, uh, at least in northern Michigan, you should have white hares. You can talk to me later if we need to update our maps. maps. Um, and we are also testing this in the field. So we have a project uh, with some lovely people in, in uh, Stockholm University uh, looking at polymorphic populations of foxes and actually measuring selection on these two different morphs uh, and predicting future snow cover and future mismatch and trying to really calculate how quickly these animals might be able to adapt and um, resist under climate change. And with that, I would just like to thank a lot of people. And so we have, I have a lot of collaborators that either give me data or, or help me and support me. And uh, I would like to thank my advisor and then our, our Mills lab, and then a lot of funders and a lot of universities that um, yeah, tolerate me and uh, I've learned from. And, and thank you so much for being here this hour. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, um, great talk. Uh, I was wondering, so um, if you've got the snowshoe hares and their predators are presumably Arctic foxes, or are there, do their predators- Snowshoe hares or mountain hares? So snowshoe hares, do their predators also change color? Oh, so the, yeah. And okay. does that, can the snowshoe hares detect them. Do they also have a mis mismatch, and does that oh. enable the snowshoe hares to detect the predators more easily? Yes, it's like two-level mismatch. Uh, I don't know. So this this is another thing we are uh, really starting to un try to understand how uh, mismatch matters for different uh, ecological uh, level. So so does it affect predator as much as as hares? I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I have a question. So maybe if phenology is more constrained, is your lab going to look at morphological traits that might help them uh, evade predators better if they are more obvious targets? So maybe are they quicker? Do they have longer limbs? Yeah. Are they bigger? Yeah, I'm not sure. So at least for snowshoe hares, it's, it's bad news with other traits because they're really well adapted to snow. So even if they are mismatched, now there is no snow, so they lose that speed advantage of snow. Um, I'm not sure what the other, yeah, so it's not speed. Uh, they don't go on the ground. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Do you have an idea, Is, or did you ask first? Well, 
Well, when I saw the mountain hare, I thought, well, they're a lot bigger, so they might have fewer predators. So I'm wondering if, um, as time goes on, maybe you might start seeing some sort of trait become more and more uh -huh, prevalent uh -huh. in the snowshoe hares. Not that I yeah. know what would be best for yeah. them to evade all of these different predators, yeah, but. More, more babies, maybe, or something. Yeah, <laughs> there you go, because they're not having enough already. Sorry, I have another question. Um, I was wondering if you see um, any kind of active molting in these in these animals, like if they decide to um, groom themselves a lot or if they rub up against things to try and get rid of that white yeah. um, fur when they're molting. Yeah, so it's been described in weasels. Um, in the spring, they're able to really quickly um, yeah, rub off old fur. Um, and then I read about it in Arctic hares, but I never saw that in, uh, I never saw it in snowshoe hares and mountain hares. Um, yeah, and then I cannot think of any other behavior they could really change to, um, because they also, so those coats are also warmer, so I don't know if that's really because they see that they are mismatched or because they just get hot and want to get rid of the fur. Um, but yeah, if you think of more behaviors they could change, may maybe they know and maybe I'm, you know, giving them that red for, for no reason, but. Uh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>